Bienvenidos. Thank you for joining our event, Prioritizing Biodiversity and Green Energy, a conversation with President of Costa Rica, Carlos Alvarado, hosted by the John Brodimus Center of New York University and the NYU Washington DC site. My name is Christina Bolin, and I am a third year student in the Global Leadership Program at NYU Washington DC. I am honored today to introduce the panel to you all. And we ask that you all please use the Q&A feature. We will be monitoring that in the backgrounds. But today we are joined with Claudia S. DeWint. Claudia is an international lawyer from the Dominican Republic and CEO of the Inter-American Institute on Justice and Sustainability, IIJS. She is a visiting scholar at the Environmental Law Institute, ELI, and adjunct associate professor at American University, Washington College of Law. She is also an allied researcher of the Center of Constitutional Studies of the Supreme Court of Mexico and judicial interpreter of the Court of First Instance of Santo Domingo. Claudia is a member of the steering committee of the World Commission on Environmental Law of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, which is the group of experts from the United Nations Environment Program for crimes that have serious impacts on the environment and a member of the group of experts in environmental law of the association agreement between the European Union and Central America. Now to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Giovanni Vicente Romero. Giovanni writes an internationally acclaimed column for CNN. He is a Washington DC based political strategist, consultant and lecturer. Giovanni publishes investigative and analytical articles on political communication, democracy, development, human rights, governance, elections, the environment, and the role of women in society. He founded the Dominican Republic Center of Public Policy, Development, and Leadership. Giovanni earned a master's degree in political communications and strategic governance from the George Washington University and is a PhD candidate in political science and public administration at the University of Mercia, Spain. Giovanni is also the recipient of the Dominican National Youth Award for Professional Excellence, which is the nation's highest award and honor for people 35 and under. And to introduce our president of Costa Rica, Carlos, Carlos Alvarado. President Alvarado took office as the president of Costa Rica on May 8th, 2018. At 38, he is Latin America's youngest president. Previously, President Alvarado served as Minister of Labor and Social Security and faced an urgent need for economic reform to address the country's fiscal imbalance, an ambitious environmental agenda, challenging trends in security and an increasingly complex regional and international context. President Alvarado will share his country's journey and global vision for multilateral approaches to environmental policy. Named champion of the Earth for Policy Leadership by the United Nations, Costa Rica offers the world an example on how to balance development and the environment. Given the focus of the US President Joe Biden's administration on sustainability and climate change, this important conversation will educate our dynamic community about Costa Rica's best practices. Thank you all so much for joining and I will hand it over to our moderator Giovanni to begin. Thank you so much, Christina. We really appreciate this kind of introduction. Good afternoon to everyone joining us in the United States and good morning to those tuning in from Costa Rica across, from, across Latin America and Europe. Please follow this discussion by using the hashtag 
DC Dialogues. On behalf of the, UNEC, of the New York University and NYU Bradema Center, welcome to NYU DC Dialogues Conversation with Mr. Carlos Alvarado Quesada, President of Costa Rica, to discuss prioritizing biodiversity and green energy. It is an honor hosting you today, Mr. President. Thank you to President Alvarado and to today's audience for joining us for this important event. Without a doubt, we can say that last week, last week has been nothing short of historic for the global community combating the effects of climate change. April 22nd marked Earth Day and was followed by a World Leaders Climate Summit hosted by President Biden. In the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, there is newfound energy and momentum to address the irreversible impacts of global warming. That's why we are fortunate to have you join us today, as well as Claudia De Wind, CEO of the Inter-American Institute on Justice and Sustainability. Claudia will provide regional and global perspectives during today's discussion. We will begin with Kidno remarks from President Alvarado, followed by Claudia De Wind in a dialogue with questions and answers. For those of you who have questions during this event, please submit them in the Q&A feature below and don't forget to state your name and affiliation. Okay, right now we are going to turn to President Alvarado for his opening remarks. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanni, and thank you to Christina and to Claudia and to all the people that are joining. If uh, there's any uh, inconvenience with the sound, just let me know, uh, but I believe it's okay. So I would like to talk for the next 15 to 20 minutes a little bit, and I'll be using, if I may, free images, free pictures, and not to have the complications of a presentation, I'll be putting those from my cell phone in a very not orthodox way. But uh, throughout these free pictures or photographs, I want to tell things, uh, make free points that I do believe are relevant. So I'm going to show you the first one here. This is from last Thursday, I believe. You see, that's my, it's a selfie. <laughs> And that's myself, and this is Edward Lu, and the other one is Franklin Chan. Ed Lu is an astronaut from the United States. He's, his parents are migrants from China, and he uh, has been to space three times, and one of them, he spent six months in the space, International Space Station. The other one is Franklin Chan. He's from Costa Rica. And actually he has the record, he shares the record of uh, more um, space travel. He's been to space seven times and he's a Costa Rican. And as you can say by his name, he's Franklin Chang Diaz. He's also, um, his, his dad is a migrant and they are from migrant family, but they are, were raised in Costa Rica just as Edwards Lou family. Why am I telling you this? When we were uh, having lunch, Costa Rica just last week uh, inaugurated a, a private space radar to track space junk that are destroying satellites and stuff like that. So we were uh, celebrating that accomplishment built by human talent in Costa Rica, by Costa Ricans. And we were having lunch and Edward mentioned that just before coming back to earth, he was having lunch with some of the fellow astronauts looking from the space to the earth, down below, the earth was under feet looking through the, through the windows of the, of the spaceship, whatever you call it. And he remembered that the fellow astronaut said, man, from here, we look so small. You can, this is the, the planet, this blue and green gigantic uh, surface. We are so small, almost insignificant. He remembered the astronauts say. And then he paused, but and at the same time he said, but look, we are so small and still 
we are standing on this spaceship built by humans because of scientists, because of physicists, because of engineers, men and women that had created this magnificent piece of technology so we can be standing here making progress. And why am I mentioning this? What does that first picture means to me? It means courage, it means passion, it means discipline, and it means doing the right thing. And I think the whole discussion currently about the climate crisis, the loss of biodiversity, and the necessity to go into green energy, it's not only a matter of numbers, which it is, and it's not only a matter of, uh, of survival, because it is, but it's also a matter of the heart. We need to be courageous. I mean, these two fellows, they are astronauts and they work their life to, to reach their goals for the well-being of humanity. Well, similarly, we need to do the same in terms of addressing climate change and the climate crisis. We need to be passionate about it. We're not going to prevail if we don't address this global problem as a human community committed to make it change happen and good change happen. So that's my first point. Uh, you can have figures, data, best practices, but if you don't address it with the mind and the heart, uh, we might not prevail in this, in this challenge. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Costa Rica. And the point I want to make here is that because of how our societies work, how capitalism work, we are very focused on the now and the present. And we are driven not to think either on the history and on the legacy of what happened before us that has made the, the present what it is, and we do not tend to have a compromise with the future. We are very driven to the present. We do not necessarily think of our ancestors of being here and being here, I mean, whatever they did 50 years ago, 70 years ago, 20 years ago is affecting today. We tend not to think about it. But also in the same perspective, whatever we do now is going to affect the future generation, even of those who are not yet being born. There's a Chinese saying, and I like that very much, that says that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. And that's, that's the best way to, the way to frame why we need to have co-responsibility throughout generations and change our mindset of only thinking in the now and in the present to thinking it about generations. And that's very important because it's this generation that holds in its hands the future of the whole humanity. I mean, if we do not change the tendency of the climate crisis, the planet and humanity will not have the capacity to sustain life. And that's the responsibility of this generation. That was not the responsibility of one generation ago, two, well, it was somehow, but we know it. I mean, it's not the responsibility of people that live, used to live in the ancient times, in the Middle Ages or in the Renaissance, but it's all the human legacy that we are holding in our hands today, now. If we were thinking about, well, I would love to live in a very relevant time in history, it is now. The whole of the legacy of humanity is now in our hands and we, it depends if it continues or not. In terms of legacy, for example, Costa Rica currently has 99.5% of its electric energy produced by renewable sources. 99.5. That means that whatever you produce out of electricity in Costa Rica is clean and renewable already. And that is why we're shifting all our vehicles to electric vehicles to reduce our main carbon footprint, which is transportation. Our 
decarbonization plan that was launched in 2019, that was the first of, it, the first of its kind, aligned with the Paris Agreement in a very ambitious plan, has 10 pillars and three of them has to do with transportation because that's the main, uh, our main sources of uh, carbon emissions. So we're shifting private transportation to clean transportation, electric vehicles, because they're already green, clean and renewable because of our electric grid, using mass transportation as well to reduce emissions and to make a better world and better life, lifestyles, more healthy lifestyles. We are in the process of building a electric train no emissions whatsoever and change the way we transport ourselves. And also in public transportation in buses, shifting from diesel buses to electric buses. That's going to dramatically reduce in the pillars of transportation, our emissions. But why we can do that now? Because 70 years ago, that generation of Costa Ricans started thinking that instead of importing expensive polluting energies such as petrol, oil, we had the possibility to build hydroelectric electricity and dams. We had lots of volcanoes and we were able to build also thermal plants, but from the gases and the heat of volcanoes, no emissions whatsoever, and also all the other renewables. So that transition we started about 50 years ago, it's, uh, no, it's more, it's uh, 60 years ago. And now we benefit from that, from those decisions, we benefit from those. Similarly with the national parks, talking about biodiversity, the national park system in Costa Rica started in the 1970s. And at the time people say you're, to, to the leaders at the moment, you're crazy instead of what a, a national park is worthless. You should cut all the trees, sell them and put some livestock there and sell the meat. That was the approach. And the leadership at the time say no. Through conservation, we develop a very profitable economic agenda on ecotourism, which is what we call a green clean industry. So ecotourism based on national parks that are about 50% of our territory, adding up to that other protected areas, currently Costa Rica has 50, about more than 50% of its land territory covered by forests. In the eighties, it used to be 20% because of deforestation. When I was born, so 40 years after that, we have recovered 30% of our forests. And you can see the trend on biodiversity. More frequently, our cameras in the forest capture jaguars, they capture pumas, species that were thought to have lost a lot of their biomass. You start to see them again because of the recovery of their ecosystems. And that's also a way we attract, we attract uh, business in a healthy way. There's no clash between doing the right thing and the economy, if you think about it. From the whole of our decarbonization plan, the Inter-American Development Bank did an economic study. And they say that taking off the investments, the net gain of it is $41,000 million to 2015 of implementing the plan in terms of the economy, in terms of health in terms of transportation, in terms of adding value to our production. So it's not only the, the good way to go, the ethical way to go, but it's also profitable way to go, we believe. So the, this second point, being the first, being passionate about this, the second is we have to think in terms of generations. What we do now affects the future. What people did in the past affected us. And there's a huge responsibility. So I wanted to show you my second picture to close this, this point. You see? And that's my son. That's Gabriel. He's seven. He's a little boy. 
Yeah. So he's seven. And if you think about it, in a couple of years, if we do not act, the world is going to be a tough place. I mean, he's just a kid. Think about your, your if you have children or if you're planning to have a family or your nephews, what kind of a planet are going to we to, to give them? And I want to do, and I think that's why we have to be passionate about this. We need to do the right things in order to give the right answer to them in a couple of years when they ask us, you knew about this, what were the actions you took? So that's very important uh, for us. Um, I believe globally, we have a new uh, drive for, uh, for the climate crisis agenda, which I believe is positive. But I want to make just a point of, or two before opening to, to, well, to a conversation, because if not, I will be just talking for a whole of a while. And I believe that's not the, the idea. First, on biodiversity and about the, the size of our actions, being size Costa Rica, as so-called small country, but also us as individuals, being what, what's the power behind us as individuals? Everybody's always seeking to, to see uh, how great uh, big leaders are going to change this. And well, that it's necessary, it's true. But also as, as individuals, we need to, to also take action. We need to vote. We need to hold accountable in democracies, those who have the power to take, make the decisions. And there is no small action. The matter of big and small is relative. And I want to, and sorry, this is not a great picture I have to say, but I want to show you this. This is a map. I think it's not that clear, but it's a map of Costa Rica. So you can see Costa Rica there, a little like orange, but I don't want to you to put your attention on that. Put your attention on the borders on the ocean. You can see like a big circle around here in the ocean. Well, that is because in the middle of it is the Cocos Island. So Costa Rica is like in this map, you can see Costa Rica is only 8% land territory. And the 92% of the rest of Costa Rica is ocean. We are part of the high ambition coalition for nature and earth. That's putting the goal, the high ambition goal, that by 2030, each country should have 30% of their land protected and their most important ecosystems and 30% of their oceans. And scientists said that this is a way that preserving that you can preserve the rest of uh, ecosystems. For example, in the ocean, if you protect 30%, this means you're protecting the reproductive areas of some species. And this is, all, is, this is going to make fisheries more sustainable. Or if you're protecting biodiversity in the land, you're protecting several species that could develop new uh, treatments or new products to benefit humanity instead of tearing those apart. So by this year, Costa Rica leading that coalition with France and the UK, we're going to protect 30% of our ocean, expanding the region of the Cocos Island that's protected. Why am I telling you this? Because the size of the ocean that we are going to protect is going to be more or less equivalent to the size of Costa Rica in land. So those things matter. Those things matter. And whatever we tell our leaders to be accountable of matters and to be passionate about these matters because it's not easy. There's a lot of people saying, no, you should not do that being passionate about it, being responsible in a generation perspective and doing the right thing, no matter what your reach of liberty is. Finally, I have to say that climate change is not only a matter of biodiversity and green energies, it is 
And indeed, we need to change that. But it's throughout what we see it's happening today in humanity. For example, migrations. Central America is one of the regions less or most harmed by climate change and by hurricanes, for example. And whenever a hurricane hits a region in a strongest way due to the variation of temperatures, how it affects peasants in the whole of Central America, how it affects the crops, the jobs, the security, women, has a strong impact even on democracy. The topic of climate change has impacts in democracies, in agriculture, in gender. So we need to start looking at this at a more multi-dimensional fashion, manner, way. Because it's not just one or two topics, it's very interlinked. And we need to walk the talk. And I want to, to put an example why I'm mentioning walking the talk. And this, I have to be honest, I've been sad for this in a while, but I am confident this tendency is going to change. Whenever the pandemic started, for example, we were talking about leaving nobody, no one behind. And we were talking about the necessity to address climate change. And uh, I've been to lots of uh, conversations, leaders, and, and that was the talk, leaving no one behind and addressing climate change. And both, I agree. But for example, when you see now the process of vaccination, 54% of the vaccines are in the countries that have 16% of the population and the higher income. It's been said that there are countries that have enough vaccines to vaccinate twice their population. So it's tough talking so much of leaving no one behind and having this happen at the same time. Why I'm mentioning this? Because we can keep talking a lot about uh, climate change, but we need to walk the talk. We need to walk the talk and deliver the results and have talk be action and held our leaders accountable to their actions. Well, I'm talking about myself. They need to hold me accountable to, to what I'm doing, my citizen, my, my people. But that was, those were the, the thoughts I wanted to share with you at this point. And I really appreciate you, your patience and your time for uh, listening to me. And I'll be glad to, to have a further conversation with, with you all. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President Alvarado. I think these things you just mentioned really matter. matter. And thank you for your inspiring insights into Costa Rica's vision for biodiversity and a model of development. I think that hearing you say about what your country is doing in terms of protecting 30% of your ocean and running your economy on a 30%, you know, like 99.5% of green energy is really impressive. I think this really makes Costa Rica a very unique case. So uh, what a thought-provoking opener this uh, I think we look forward to following up on your remarks during the questions and answer session. And now we turn to Claudia De Wint, who will contextualize Costa, Rica, Costa Rica's experience within the Latin American region. Thank you, Giovanni. Good morning. I would like to first thank the John Bradama Center of the New York University, and I would like to thank you, Giovanni Vicente Romero, for hosting this event. It's an absolute privilege to have been invited to this conversation with President Carlos Alvarado on issues of utmost importance, not only to Costa Rica, but to the region. Um, Costa Rica, as we have heard, is a leading country on sustainability, is also home of the Inter-American Human Rights Court, talking about leaving no one behind. And having served almost 20 years at the OAS, I've spent significant time in Costa Rica. Uh, it's, a it's very dear to my heart. It's a place that I have almost called home at um, times during so many cooperation and negotiation processes. 
I wish to take this opportunity and the presence of President Alvarado to pay tribute to Costa Rican government officials previously and currently in institutions such as MINAE, the National Directorate for Climate Change, COMEX, ICE, CONAGEVIO, as well as the Specialized Environmental Unit of the Attorney General and the Judiciary for their leadership and hard work, which shows in the recent NDC and reporting of progress to the UNFCCC, as well as in the state of the environmental rule of law in the country. We are to discuss, and we have started discussing, prioritizing biodiversity and energy, both areas of environmental sustainability that play a key role in achieving the collectively set targets under the Paris Agreement, which are critical to the well being of our present and future generations, as Pre President Alvarado has said. This is a critical time in history, a time in which we live multiple crises at once an ecological one, which includes biodiversity and climate, a sanitary and health crisis, which is interrelated to the ecological crisis, and a financial one. Clearly, despite the disproportional role in contributing to these crises, they affect in greater magnitude developing countries and those citizens that historically have been most vulnerable. While climate change has captured public attention and risen up the political and corporate agendas, biodiversity has lagged behind. The current scenario has changed the reality. There is an increased realization that our fate is inextricably linked to that of the rest of nature. Biodiversity, the full variety, the cycle, or the tapestry of life, as it has often been referred to, is in danger. And so are we. Our lives, as President Alvarado has clearly emphasized, is at stake here. Loss of species is accelerating at an unprecedented rate, and a million species currently face extinction. We have transformed land and ecosystems more rapidly and extensively than any other generation in history. And 25% of the global greenhouse gas emissions are caused by this land use change. So it is not climate or biodiversity. It is both in an integrated approach that takes people into account, that takes into account equity and rights of people intergenerationally. Greatly, I have to say, it's holding our leaders accountable, as has been mentioned by President Alvarado. It is governance and the rule of law which will determine how much we all suffer. I don't mean to give a green scenario. I am an optimist. There is no time. We have no time. Let's be clear about that. But there's opportunity. While in unusual and adaptive circumstances, this year, the biodiversity and climate conferences of the parties are taking place. These forums are to focus on the post-2020 biodiversity framework. How do we tackle species loss and financing Paris and a just and climate transition, which by the way, is part of the NDC, the nationally determined contribution that Costa Rica has recently um, updated. We can still be the agents of the necessary transformation our planet and we all need. In the 70s, Costa Rica's deforestation was astonishing. Today, they are a country as has been mentioned by President Alvarado, with the most forest coverage in Central America, while providing financial and livelihood incentives for their people. There are challenges in the area of oceans, but a few years ago, a Vice Ministry of Oceans and Coast was created, taking into account the proportion of um, oceans and coasts that um, it's part of the, um, of the country. And these challenges are being addressed with the 3030 High Ambition Coalition and has been mentioned the Coco Galapagos Corridor Initiative and the Central American Commission on Environment and Development Oceans Group, among others. The energy matrix as has been mentioned by President Alvarado, more than 99% clean energy. How many countries can say um, this about themselves? Today, the transformation of the transport sector is exemplary. If you have not visited the, the Ciclovías in San Jose, I wholeheartedly invite you to do so. Sharing Costa Rica's creativity, courage, passion, and discipline, and perhaps unorthodox ways in doing the right thing, as President Alvarado has mentioned, in crafting their experience in nature-based solutions for people and in addressing challenges some challenges remain, we have to be frank, land use change is still a challenge and there are challenges in the um, transition from um, 
uh, fossil fuel, that 1% is, is, is little, but it's still, um, still there in the difference of the energy um, uh, matrix. So within those two areas and with an integral approach, we need to assume the short-term cost, including political. Otherwise, we will have long-term loss. This is critical to the change and the opportunity we need to achieve a just and sustainable society. So I will leave it at that so that we can start our conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia, for this inner overview. Uh, Costa Rica's experience is certainly unique and a model for the region, if not the world. As a reminder, please submit your questions for President Alvarado or our guest speaker and environmental expert, Claudia De Wind. Let's begin with learning a little more about President Alvarado and how he got to where he is right now. He is such an inspiration for NYU students. I have to acknowledge that. And here's my first question for President Alvarado. 10 years ago, could you imagine yourself becoming president of your country? Please tell us what it's like being Latin, Latin America's youngest president, interacting with other peer leaders. What advice do you have for NYU students who demonstrate leadership in their fields and want to, to grow? Please, President Alvarado. Thank you, Giovanni, and thank you, Claudia. Well, 10 years ago, I never imagined I'll be president, to tell the truth. And that was never an ambition, a personal ambition I, I, I had. I mean, what I am ambitious or what I like is positive change and creativity, but not necessarily <laughs> being on the spotlight. That uh, tends to be not that comfortable. And more in politics. I mean, politics is not an easy, an easy arena, on the contrary. But uh, I felt that it was necessary. Uh, when I ran for president, there was a huge wave of populism across the region, and I believe across the world. And uh, at the time, we in Costa Rica was not the exception. And in my political party, at the time we were in government, as we still are. And uh, but there was no, there was, there was not an optimistic approach on what was going to happen in the election. So nobody was about to run. And I felt that was not acceptable given the risks we were facing of populism and of fiscal default. So that's why I said, well, if it's not acceptable, you should do something about it. And, and I did, and, and I ended up here. <laughs> but I believe because it's more of a it's, a, it's because of responsibility and also the responsibility with, with the country, with my child, uh, with what I believe in. And also to set the record straight, I believe I was, I was the youngest when I arrived office, but I believe now the, there is at least one younger president, I believe is uh, Mr. Bukele from Salvador. I believe he's younger than, than I am, yeah. Well, I think clearly your story is very inspirational and we are fortunate to have you here. And uh, I, I, there is something else I really find very interesting about your country. Costa Rica has no military and is an island of stability. Everybody knows that in a turbulent region. Please explain the origins of this policy and how it defines the Costa Rican identity and what role biodiversity and green energy play. I think that's a trait that uh, really changed culturally our approach on many things. I mean, we just celebrated 71 years without a military. So that means that we already almost have three generations of Costa Ricans that have no idea whatsoever of what the army is. Only the, the, the elders might remember something, but for the rest of us, we are very used to, well, basically the civil police, but, but that's about it. So that changed how we, we look at things. Uh, also because many of, instead of using budget for the military, it was mainly used for education and for uh, health. So uh, at the end of the day, people, again, they said that it's going to be impossible. You're not going to be safe. Uh, 
And here we are 71 years after that. And we do rely on international instruments of rule of law and we believe in those and we believe in democracy and peace in a way to, to handle our, our relations with, with uh, in the region and with friends. And so, so yeah, it changes how we, our approach on, on, on the way of life. Uh, it's not easy. You have to say democracy and peace, you have to build day by day. It's not something that's built on a rock. It's more, it's a living thing. You have to nurture it constantly. And it's, and it's not with their setbacks. I mean, for example, we, even though we have so many accomplishments on environment, today we are discussing a bill on, uh, on uh, what's called the El Acuerdo de Escazú to protect people uh, in, in terms of information and environmental issues and justice. And there are many people in Congress that don't want to vote it and then the private sector. And, and that, that it's contraintuitive of what our, our standard, our legacy is, but that's the reality. I mean, we have to fight with that reality and we're pushing uh, to have that approved, but there are people that are against it. Similar, well, myself being a president, I had to veto the law that uh, created the, or give permission to the, to the, I believe it's trawling fisheries, said in English, the pesca de arrastre. And I had to veto that law because it's, it's very harmful. And also the studies mentioned that it increases the emissions of carbon fixed on the bottom of the oceans. So you can say, you can say it's not all honky dory. And sometimes it becomes very, very complex issues or trying to protect wildlife. For example, in the case of, of sharks, and uh, it's very, it's a topic very complex also because of the of people living out of fishery. But I do believe that expanding the protected areas, just like in the Cocos Island, or having laws such as the Acuerdo de Escazú or the wildlife uh, bills that are in Congress approved might uh, help us as well to, to go to the next level. But that's not as easy as saying everybody is in favor, no. Sometimes there's, there are backlashes that trying to, to move you apart from what you have already accomplished. So it's tough. Fascinating. I think it's inspiring to hear how your country has been contributing its legacy and vision, not only when it comes to addressing climate change, but also securing peace. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, going back to Claudia, please tell us about sustainable development in the region. Anything that jumps out of, of you about Costa Rica that we haven't discussed yet or that you might want to address in more detail. I know the president just mentioned the Acuerdos of uh, Escazú, and you are very familiar with this legislation, international legislation, but just to know, uh, you know, what jumps out of you in, about Costa Rica and its legacy in terms of sustainable development. So I, I think, thank you, Giovanni, for that very interesting uh, question. And, and President Alvarado is absolutely right. Democracy is hard work, but democracy is interlinked to sustainability and in particular to environmental um, stewardship. So I, I, frankly, I think uh, sustainable development is all about balance, finding the right balance. And sometimes the decisions that our leaders are going to make are not going to please everyone as President Alvarado has, has made, but you have to sacrifice sometimes political um, uh, capital. And in my opinion, I've never been in the spot and I don't want to be sitting in, in your position, Mr. President, <laughs> but um, I think you have to find for the greater good. So it's all about, but it's also about being able to have the scientific information and the scientific basis to make the right decision. So in case of Escazú, Costa Rica was a leader in negotiating this, this, um, this multilateral uh, agreement, which is the first um, uh, regional agreement to address access to information, public participation, and justice on environmental uh, matters. It's, it's named Escazú because of um, uh, Costa Rica and the beautiful place where the final rounds of the negotiations um, took place. But um, ratifying Escazú means sacrificing 
political capital, someone, someone and some interest are going to suffer. There's always something that's got to give to find that right balance. But at the end of the day, I think that, um, and we hope that our leaders and, uh, are going to make the right choices in terms of prioritizing both nature and people. And when I say people, I, I, I think that the livelihoods are clearly important. The example of the fisheries that was given by um, President Alvarado is not unique to, to Costa Rica. We've seen it in many countries um, of the region. And there are, you know, there are ways uh, to deal with it. The very innovative payment for ecosystem services that you have implemented in, in, in Costa Rica. It's one transponded to the ocean uh, 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 context. And um, like, like that, there are others, so. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. And now I'm just gonna turn back to President Alvarado. And, well, I'd like to know how has Costa, Costa Rica dealt with migration flows from the Northern Triangle in Venezuela, for example? And has Costa Rica's environmental stewardship contributed to the country's stability while other countries suffer from environmental degradation? Costa Rica is rich in natural resources, we all know that, and also in biodiversity. I would like to, to hear President Alvarado take on this issue. Well, thank you, Juani. First, I, I always like to challenge the concept of, uh, of the Northern Triangle. I believe it's not the best approach. For example, when, when the free trade agreement with the United States was negotiated, um, it was the whole of Central America and Dominican Republic with the United States. And that's the region of SICA. Our integration system is SICA is the whole of Central America from Panama to Guatemala, including Belize and in Dominican Republic. And, and that's, let's say, that's a historical and political unit uh, that has almost, uh, the system has almost 30 years and establish it after the, 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 the military conflicts in Central America. So I do believe that the best approach is thinking about the whole region because we share common problems, for example, in terms of climate change. Uh, it is true that uh, there are several drivers for migrations, but migration is, let's say, it's the consequence of a series of previous uh, events or situations that we need to address. If uh, it, it's not by uh, addressing migration itself that we are going to fix it regionally. Uh, in the case of Costa Rica, for example, we have important flows of mi migration going up north, passing from Panama to Costa Rica and then to Nicaragua. But for example, there are lots of uh, people coming from Haiti and, there, and if you look about the situation in Haiti, it has to do with environment, has to do with institutions, has a lot of things to do. It not necessarily has the international community attention, but then it has an impact on the Dominican Republic and has an impact on Panama, it has an impact on Costa Rica, and many of them looking for the United States. But we don't address the, the topic which is on the, on the origin, which is the situation on Haiti in this case similar with, uh, with Central America. So I do believe that we need to require a more comprehensive regional approach with our partners in the United States, with the whole of the region to improve from how we address climate change, labor, gender, and also how we, uh, how we address uh, democratic institutions. I believe that's the best way to go and then Working on that foundation, we might have other uh, other results in topics such as uh, migration, but also on drug trafficking, on uh, how strong the institutions are, and it's uh, it's also that that path. It's not uh, about one year or two. We need to be consistent about it because we tend to pay attention whenever we have a big flow of migration, but then we turn around. So I do believe we, we need to be consistent as a region, thinking about how we can work together and, and, and help ourselves as 
all as neighbors in, in this part of the hemisphere. I couldn't agree more, pressing on this you just said. And here I have a question for you both. And I would like us to be short and sweet for this one because I want to have the chance to turn to questions from the audience uh, eventually, of course. But in 2021, you know, 2021 is proving to be a banner year for global sustainability and energy with the much anticipated COP26 and Global Climate Leadership Summit that President Biden hosted last week. Costa Rica has been a tremendous example of climate leadership. And I was surprised to see Costa Rica not invited to the World Climate Leader, Leaders Summit. What are your thoughts on the United States taking on the on a new leadership in the climate sustainability agenda? Are there areas where both countries can increase collaboration in this regard? Sure, I hope uh, that, uh, well, uh, my first conversation with President Biden was uh, very focused on working together in terms of addressing climate crisis, the climate crisis. And we already see the, the change of the approach uh, that makes us very hopeful of what we can see. Also because uh, whenever you, you I, I, this is not about uh, all leaders, but some leaders tend to say, well, this is very important, but now we are very focused on COVID-19 and now we're very focused on creating jobs. So, so the environmental agenda or the climate agenda becomes kind of a nice to have, not a survival issue, but like a collateral. Um, so having the U.S. put in this in the middle of the agenda, I believe is going to drive the attention of lots of uh, countries that perhaps were not as committed. Uh, I have to say that our approach has been during my administration of um, leading by example, doing the things, not necessarily uh, talking about those, but delivering. Uh, delivering the results in the different, having the plan of decarbonization, achieving the milestones on it, uh, going for a high ambition coalition, increasing the protected areas uh, while having jobs. And this also throughout the, a pandemic, but uh, we need, to, we need to, to address both at the same time. Both are global crises and the complexity of our thought has to be more comprehensive. We can all, we can not only say, okay, we're going to do first COVID and forget about everything. Actually, there are several, just like uh, South Korea, they're talking about a green recovery using the, or leveraging on the crisis of COVID-19 to propel a green recovery. So South Korea is very much into it. I see also Europe very, into that uh, agenda and i believe that's that's the way to talk but for me the most important part of it is delivering results i believe it was jose marti that said something like uh, the west the best way of uh, saying is doing and we do believe in that kind of uh, of leadership uh, and so i believe that's that's the test we need to pass now globally in matters of a climate crisis. Absolutely, and I think just to follow up on your answer, uh, those global leaders who were invited to this summit last week in the United States were those from the countries that produce 80% of the global emissions. So we have to acknowledge that. Uh, now, I would like to know if Claudia has anything to add to this question or will I just ask you a different one, Claudia? Are you ready? Yeah, I, 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 will, I will just add that I don't, um, I, I don't take a, in a negative fashion that Costa Rica was not invited to the summit just because of what you said and that and of economies of scales because we're talking about the most polluting uh, countries and at the same time countries that have a significant leadership on tackling climate change. But in terms of scale, the size of Costa Rica cannot be compared to the other countries with climate leadership and how that affects the whole 
um, global um, scenario. I also think that this summit provides, um, and, and the outcomes and the takeaways of the summit provide opportunity for renewed cooperation, including under the free trade agreement with Central America and the Dominican Republic under the environment um, uh, chapter. I also think that the discussions at the summit means that there will be more diplomacy on the ground from, from the, the US and more climate um, uh, diplomacy discussions, discussions on the migrations of, uh, of um, the migrants of climate. I know Vice President Harris is soon to visit uh, the region to have some discussions on, um, on migration. And I think opportunity on um, transferring uh, emissions. Costa Rica, as it has been said, because of the national park system and the mechanisms that has um, uh, created, has significant natural resources, significant biodiversity, and those credits can be uh, transferred to other countries that need to mitigate their climate uh, inputs. And Costa Rica's leadership in debt for nature swaps can be uh, used now in climate debt swaps. So those were my two cents on that one. Talin, how can the global community do more to balance economic growth with biodiversity? So I, I think that uh, as President Alvarado has said, each and one of us is responsible. We all have an ecological um, a, a footprint. And I think that we need to find a common value set. These talks, the formal negotiations are a good platform and an opportunity to advance um, the agenda, but there are things that can happen outside of the uh, of the negotiating table through the leadership of the uh, private sector and mechanisms such as those that Costa Rica has established that provide for the li livelihoods of uh, the people so that truly no one can stay behind. And this pandemic provides the opportunity uh, for us. If there's anything that the pandemic has um, uh, highlighted is the need for the recovery uh, to be green. And the uh, IMF is looking into that, the World Bank is looking into that, the IDB is looking into that, and the global community needs to internalize those um, criteria for the green recovery. Thank you so much. And now we will proceed with questions from the audience. And the first question comes in as a comment regards from Evelyn Rojas, the president of the leader, Mujeres Líderes Políticas, and she wants to, to say hello, of course, to the panelists because this organization is tuning in today. So the first question comes from Adrian Sibaja. He is a Costa Rican NYU student. Here he goes. How do you plan to expand your carbon reduction project to more remote areas of the country, such as rural communities, that rely upon private transportation due to lack of public transportation and infrastructure. This one goes to President Alvarado from a fellow countryman. Brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, in rural areas, for example, one of the pillars of the decarbonization plan has to do with all the, um, the NAMA facilities, the National Adaptation and Mitigation, yeah, I always lost on the last A. But on the NAMAS, it's a way of producing in a more sustainable way, but also adding value. For example, we launched our first NAMA in coffee in 2015. It was the world's first. And uh, though it's kind of a also not only more sustainable way of producing, but also adds value to whatever the peasant or the, or the farmer uh, can sell its coffee. Also, we are in the decarbonization plan. We are working on uh, musasias, which is banana plantain, rice, sugarcane, and livestock. And in transportation in rural areas, it is true that our transportation system, it's not the best, uh, particularly for rural areas. We are sending this uh, in a couple of weeks, a bill uh, which is uh, aiming to change the how we have the lines of transport so it's called sectorization starting with the urban areas but also including the rural areas and the, those are aimed to in the urban areas or to electrifying transportation but also we need to find the schemes to subsidize transportation in particularly in the rural areas 
uh, lines in rural areas are mostly held by small entrepreneurs who have a concession for the line. So, but not necessarily is that profitable depending on the line. So uh, having a subsidy might in increase the, well, might improve the systems in the rural areas. Great, thank you so much for, for this answer. And the second question comes from the Dominican Republic uh, from Miguel Com, who is a diplomat. And he wants to know, he wants to know what Costa Rica is doing to protect their oceans. I think president said in his opening remarks that the country is protecting 30% of the oceans. I don't know president, if you want to go ahead and, and go further in that, but I think that one was addressed already. And I have another one uh, from Engma Lizano group. I am from Costa Rica and I'm proud to hear all that my country is doing to improve the environment, the environment and fight its issues. But I wonder what is set up to fight Pesca de Arrastra. I think you mentioned that in your opening remarks as well. Uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there so you can go further. No, we already have a veto on the law that wanted to reactivate the pesca de arrastre or the trolling. But now the relevant thing is to work with, uh, with the fisheries and the fishermen and to have alternatives for production, uh, particularly in the region of, of Punta Arenas. So we need to also not, also, not only uh, not advance with that way of fishing, but also provide other livelihoods more sustainable. So that's currently the effort through the Vice Ministry of, uh, of the Oceans, which are working that agenda. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I, I would like Claudia to feel free to jump in anytime you feel like you need to add something to, to one of these questions. And um, Natalia Kobe Lars says, thank you for this inspiring presentation. What percentage of Costa Rica's energy is produced by hydroelectric dams? Given the hydroelectric dams cut the natural river flows and hence have negative impacts on biodiversity, can this type of energy be truly considered green? That's a good question. Is the country considering alternative, alternative ways to produce energy? Natalia Kovilars. She's a senior lawyer, European Court of Human Rights. Well, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, when most of the dams were built, was, as I mentioned, decades ago. It was only one that was uh, finished recently, like seven or six years ago, which is Reventazón. Um, and many of these require, yes, the flooding of certain regions or uh, stopping the, the, flu of, uh, the flow of the, of the water. So it is true they have an impact on the, uh, on the let's say, on the, on the habitats. That being said, what we have done is we have established a provision for the resting, uh, how you say, las cuencas. Uh, Watersheds. Yeah. So we preserve those. So we are not moving forward with more uh, dams. We're preserving those that we have. And we are, for example, advancing more in a geothermic energy that's the one that the, it's with the heated water from behind from beneath the the volcanoes it, it represents approximately the hydroelectric currently like it's between 70 and 80 percent of their air of our energy i believe it's less than than 80 uh, and uh, the one that follows is geothermic if i'm not mistaken the good thing of geothermic is that it's the more stable it's the most stable, it's 20, 24 seven throughout the whole, whole year. And the problem with hydroelectric is that it might also be affected by climate change because it depends on the rains. Uh, and for example, if there's a period of drought, you might have end up using um, fossil fuels. And that's the problem with that. But for, us, for the past years, we have managed to to not use fossil fuels whatsoever. And also we have um, some sources of uh, wind and of uh, solar, but the thing is that those energies so far, 
because that's one of the things that scientists are addressing. But so far, those sources are, are not as, as stable as hydro and as geothermic. So, but those are the things uh, that we need to be adjusting constantly our electric grid. Um, finally, I'd like to say that um, new technologies are going to change that. But the good thing is that we already are at a point that we have, uh, we are not burning fossil fuels in order to have energy. And that gives us a flexibility to move to other possibilities. Thank you very much. I think we are getting many, many questions and a ton of comments. And of course, for the interest of time, we are just going to uh, address a few of them, a couple more. And as some persons just said that, someone just said that awesome event uh, with a lot of a lot of honest answers. Thank you very much for acknowledging that. Um, Maria Valeria Avarca Chacon, ask which initiatives is Costa Rica taking to lead worldwide changes in terms of biodiversity and sustainability? As a Costa Rican, she's from Costa Rica, I am very proud of the work already and currently being done. Well, I think well, the I think main goal currently is the high ambition coalition for nature and earth. That's in terms of biodiversity and conservation. That's uh, the goal to protect 30% of the land and 30% of ecosystems as well in the oceans is a very ambitious goal given that so far I believe is is less than 20 percent of the land of the planet that's protected and I believe is less than 10 percent of the oceans that are protected so it's very ambitious uh, commitment but also given the size of the problem we have uh, we need to to address that but if, if we were to talk about uh, a a initiative we're leading that 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 will be like one of them but that, that's the let's say the most ambitious so far luis morales navarro said mr alvarado thank you for your intervention as you know the escaso agreement which provides a framework for the protection of environmental activists entered into force just about a week ago yet costa rica a, pr a proponent of the agreement has not ratified it. What is your government doing to facilitate its ratification and protect the human rights of environmental activists? Well, that, that's one of the complexities and the setbacks that uh, whenever we address environmental uh, topics in politics that one might get. Why? Because, and it's, I have to say, it's very embarrassing having the Escazú Agreement being defined in Costa Rica and ha having the name of Escazú and not having us ratifying it so far, it's, it's quite embarrassing. But then what we have done is we have it on the floor in Congress uh, for discussion and we are pushing for it. And we need to have the votes to have, the, have it ratify. And that's part of the complexity and that's part of the if, if it was up only to me, that will be already ratified, but it's not. It depends on the votes and it depends on the wills in the Congress. And that's part of uh, whenever some whenever we address this, uh, those are the complexities. That's why it's so necessary, as Claudia said, to have people also raising their voices. I mean, they have to, to held accountable. They have to share the scientific information and the political information of why this is so relevant. Uh, and that's, there's something going on as well. As we're in the middle of the pandemic, sometimes the argument is that, that no, that doesn't matter for, for the time being. We can wait for that. We need to address more urgent matters. Uh, and that sometimes is one of the, the complex things to deal in uh, whenever somebody's in politics trying to get these things approved. Mr. Okay. President. Please go ahead, go ahead. If Colin. I may, Giovanni, sorry, I just wanted to take on that last point of um, President Alvarado. I think that um, in, in some countries of the region, the judiciaries have um, decided in environmental cases that the pandemic should not be an excuse for lax enforcement and um, decision making. And I think it's important to highlight here that this is exactly what got us to where we are. 
not paying attention to what is relevant and what we should be valuing as a um, as a society. So I think that you know achieving that um, balance is key, but also um, getting things done and taking this time that has been granted uh, to us for progress is critical. And I think Costa Rica has been a, a, has given the world a very good example um, of that in the progress that they have shown in, in, in implementing their, um, their NDC in different areas. I see in the chat that there are questions, for example, about animal um, footprint and um, carbon a emissions how can we fit the reality is that um we need to change the way that we do agriculture to preserve our, our our biodiversity including livestock and we need to change our habits and our behavior and the law those laws that the president is talking about are critical um for that thank you very much claudia i couldn't agree more and i think now that we just mentioned the topic of justice and legislations laws. Uh, here I see a question from Rebecca Justicia. She says, President Alvarado, how far is Costa Rica from changing the national accounting system to one that includes ecosystem services as assets and their destruction as liabilities? So uh, to Rebecca, on that regard, currently in the central bank of Costa Rica, there's a project which is already ongoing. It's called Cuentas Ambientales or National Accounting in which uh, biodiversity and many aspects of uh, nature are being, uh, are being put into the national accounts. Uh, that effort is relevant because it's a first step to then implementing public policy. But if the, that being said, we need to work more in terms of making that into practice, putting that into practice, as you mentioned, for example, on the, on, on having in our accounts, put what are liabilities and what are risks. So the first step is we already have the accounting and it's one of the, the most uh, mo uh, modernized uh, in the region. It's a, it's a world-class project. But then we need to move forward in terms of policy making to, let's say that to, to what we'll say in Spanish, to aterrizar, to, to make it more concrete on how. But the project is ongoing. Uh, I'm very glad it's a, it's a project we are very proud of. I'm really glad to hear that. And uh, just for the interest of time, like I mentioned before, we are going to take two more questions to respect the time of our panelists. And this one comes from an anonymous attendee. He says, Mr. Al he or she says, Mr. Alvarado, you talk about the need of nature-based solutions for climate change and the preservation of the preservation of oceans, the oceans. What is your government doing, planning to do to, do to protect sharks, especially that they are currently considered commercial species and are not protected under Costa Rican law? Well, on that matter, uh, first, as I mentioned, the to increase the protected areas for Cocos Island is going to pro protect one of the most vast areas in which sharks uh, reproduce and the several uh, species of, of sharks. There's also a build on wildlife, which is in Congress, uh, determining several species of shark, I believe is the hammer shark, if I'm not mistaken, as part of wildlife, so not subject to, to fisheries. Um, but this, you know, there's also a debate uh, on whether, because for a pe brief period of time, the shark, uh, has the, after the fiscal reform, it has been part of the um, canasta basica, uh, the products that are exempted from the uh, VAT. Uh, but then there's a debate if that should be the case because of the kind of species it is. So we are, will be addressing that on the changes of the ca canasta basica. But that, uh, those are the things that we need to administrate um, while administrating the crisis of COVID and also of the fiscal of the finances. At the same time that we are discussing this, all the countries in the region 
uh, have their finances very affected because they have an increase of a decrease of growth, a decrease of uh, the money they get, and an increase on, of expenditure. And that's going to put pressure of all the governments in the region. Going back to that and also about walking the talk, finance is going to be a thing that all the region is going to be needing. And also the region is one that has the more the vast uh, areas of tropical forests that are the ones that fix the most carbon, also with mangroves. So if we want also to protect this, we need finance. We need to finance and we need support from the countries that produce the most of the emissions. Uh, and whenever we get to see that compromise is whenever it's going to be more, not only good, but profitable to protect forests. But then we need to have the commitment of uh, counterparts to finance that kind of uh, developments. Uh, and that, that's also what's going to, it's pending to see how, how those finance mechanisms are going to work. Um, most important now that the Biden administration has shown so, so much interest. And now we need to know how those schemes are going to work. And here it comes our last question for today's session. And this one is addressed for Claudia. And it says, it's, it's coming from Laura Locke. And she says, on a different, to different topic, what place did Claudia mention that she invites us to visit? She said the place regarding the transport sector. So maybe Claudia can elaborate a little bit more into that. Thank you, Giovanni. I was um, referring to the bicycle ways that have been um, uh, built all over San Jose and um, that are um, really fascinating way of um, not contributing to emissions and experiencing a lot of Costa Rica's um, nature and getting to work or getting to different places as a tourist. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. So Donna Cameron, uh, said, bravo, Mr. President, in Costa Rica. Very inspiring. Can you share some links about these projects about which you speak here in, or, or you know, through the chat so that we can share with our students, please, many things. I'm pretty sure that um, I'll let the president answer this one. I'm pretty sure his office will follow up with this information. Sure, we'll be glad and we'll be sending some of the those, but um, you can find the decarbonization plan of Costa Rica 2019-2050 on the web. Also, uh, you can visit the website of the High Ambition Coalition, which has the, all the what's regarding to, to the goals of protecting uh, different habitats and species and biodiversity and to push for, for that. I believe those can, you can have a uh, perspective of what is it that we are uh, pushing for in a very concrete uh, manner and with goals and targets and and the timing as well uh, this this requires not only to to have good intentions but to have goals and milestones concrete milestones so that's what we are aiming so you can look up for the decarbonization plan in a uh, in the web and also for the high ambition coalition for planet and for nature and people on on the web thank you very much mr president uh for your insights what a wonderful thoughtful discussion about costa rica and its leadership in biodiversity and green energy i'm very glad we had this opportunity today a big thank to you mr president a big thank you and Claudia they went for their time and insights today. I invite you both, you both to share any final thoughts before we close the event. You can use this time to send a message in Spanish to those tuning in from the region. So I will let uh, President Alvarado have the, the last um, word, but before we go, I would like to recognize the presence in this discussion of a very esteemed colleague and member of the IUCN steering committee of the World Commission on Environmental Law, uh, Madam Elizabeth Merema, who's the executive secretary of the UN Biodiversity Convention. Elizabeth, it's a pleasure to have us 
uh, with us um, today, listening to this very inspiring conversation, Mr. President. It is um, really touching to see a leader and uh, mind the redundancy so in touch with the reality of his country and so knowledgeable about all of these issues. I think what we all need to work on is looking at what Costa Rica has done to reduce the underlying uh, risk factors in all of the different frameworks and um, land use planning so that um, we can move forward in, in, in this agenda. So I will end with Pura Vida. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Claudia. No, I would like to to thank uh, all the thank you, Claudia, Giovanni, and all the people that have been part of this uh, of this conversation. Thank you all. Y de mi parte también en español mandarles un gran abrazo, decirles que no bajen la guardia, que tengan siempre valor, coraje, y que podemos cambiar este mundo positivamente. Así que un gran abrazo y un gran saludo desde San José, Costa Rica. Muchísimas gracias, señor presidente. Gracias, estimada Claudia. Ha sido un gran placer tener esta conversación, esta discusión tan rica en el día de hoy. Y nosotros estamos muy honrados. Thank you once again to President Alvarado and to Claudia De Wint for your generous time and insights. Thank you to everyone tuning in today. And we hope you have enjoyed this event. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Giovanni.